Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, please, uh, we are ready to, to start again our uh, meeting. Uh, the main point of, uh, of uh, this uh, morning agenda, of course, is uh, the exchange of views with uh, our uh, dear Commissioner, Mrs. Kadri Simpson, the Commissioner for Energy, and a very special guest of ITRE Committee, Mr. Fatih Birol, the Executive Director of the International Energy Agency, on the consequences on EU energy policy one year after uh, Russia's invasion and war of aggression against uh, Ukraine. I would like to welcome the two distinguished guests. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, with this, uh, it is important to look uh, what was achieved and how we uh, took the necessary measures and very good measures in order to uh, counterattack uh, the actions, uh, direct actions uh, of Russia and, of course, uh, the indirect uh, consequences of the aggression against uh, Ukraine, but also uh, uh, to look in the future, because, unfortunately, the war is not uh, over yet. Uh, some will fear of uh, some escalation, and uh, it's important uh, in uh, this context, uh, we need to respond with urgency to the several challenges uh, still in terms of security of supply, uh, maybe the high energy prices, uh, infrastructure bottlenecks, bottlenecks uh, and of course uh, to look to uh, the geopolitical uh, uh, context which was changed a lot and what we expect in the coming months and maybe years in the field of uh, energy policy. That's why uh, I'm really grateful to Commissioner Simpson and Executive Director Birol for having accepted our invitation to frame this discussion, giving their insight and uh, extraordinary expertise uh, and, uh, of course, have this exchange uh, of views uh, with us. We uh, have uh, first the introductory remarks of the two guests then a first round of political group coordinators or representatives, then the replies, the feedback from them, and then the second round, uh, we have already a number of speakers. Uh, so please, colleagues, uh, respect the time. Uh, immediately after this, we'll have also a press conference. I will have a press conference together with the commissioner and uh, executive director. By saying that, I go directly to Commissioner Kadi Simpson for uh, her introductory remarks. Please, and thank you once again for being here. Dear Christian, dear Fatih, uh, honourable members, um, good morning. And I'm grateful for Christian and uh, its committee um, for organising this debate um, to mark the one-year anniversary of the Repower EU strategy. It is very timely. The Russian war against Ukraine has caused a tremendous shift in Europe's energy system in one year. The transformation triggered by the war and by Repower EU has been unprecedented. In a moment, I will talk about how far we have come in delivering the Repower EU agenda and about what lies ahead. But first, I want to look at uh, what um, this dramatic year has meant for Ukraine and its energy system. Twelve months ago, Ukraine was the main gas transit route towards uh, the European Union, 40 PCM a year based on the trilateral agreement uh, concluded in 2019. It had a large power sector synchronised with Russian and the Prel system, even if plans for synchronisation with the European grid were in the making. Ukraine hosted four nuclear power plants, including the largest in Europe, and was committed to work on improving safety with the help of the Union. It was reforming and modernising its energy regulatory framework. So fast forward one year, since October, Ukraine's power sector has been under constant Russian missile and drone attacks. The latest took place this night. Ukrainians have endured um, constant sacrifices. Europe's largest nuclear power station in Zaporozhye is occupied by military forces in violation of all international conventions with great risks for nuclear incidents. The technicians, uh, engineers and nuclear experts are risking their lives every day and this very moment to repair and replace damaged infrastructure. Disruption on this scale could have brought uh, any energy system into its knees, uh, but Ukraine has not given up. It has resisted the invasion, and Europe has stood by Ukraine every step of the way. We were able to synchronise the Ukrainian and Moldovan electricity network in the 
space uh, of three weeks instead of two years, as previously planned. And we introduced a strong set of sanctions against Russia, including the oil and coal. Uh, we delivered 1,600 generators and 1,400 transformers to Ukraine, and I set up um, a dedicated fund with the energy community, which today totals 180 million euros in pledges. As we go forward, we will continue to support Ukraine. Currently, we are working to promote decentralised production of electricity with off-grid solar panels, and last Friday I welcomed the offer by Enel to provide Ukraine panels produced in Europe. And this is just the beginning, and I invite uh, all member states and companies to, to join this initiative and scale up. And I'm also working with ENSOE to make sure that electricity trade volumes can be progressively increased for both imports and exports. We have integrated Ukraine in the gas joint purchasing platform with a view to help secure 2 billion cubic metres of additional gas. And we are working on market reforms in the context of the accession process. And I continue engaging with the IAEA um, to insist that the occupation of Saporosia nuclear power plant is a crime and a danger to all, and every effort should be made to create a secure zone. Honourable members of the European Parliament, I wanted to start my remarks with Ukraine because this is not a side story. It's at the heart of our repower actions. The invasion of Ukraine was preceded by a manipulation by Russia of our gas markets. To destabilise the union and create uncertainty, gas supplies have been used to leverage blackmail and divide member states to weaken the resolve to oppose an unjust and illegal war. And such actions made it crystal clear that the union should put an end to a massive dependency we had on Russia built over decades. And this is exactly what we have set out to do with the Repower EU agenda. Many doubted that was it even possible, but one year on the shift uh, in the European energy system is spectacular. Let's take uh, gas diversification as an example. Since September 2022, Russian gas is about 8% of all pipeline gas imported to EU. Pipeline gas imports from Russia amounted 61 billion cubic metres last year. The first gas supplier to Europe is no longer Russia, it is Norway. Some doubted that uh, Europe would ever be able to receive the LNG that was needed to replace Russian gas due to the limitations in the physical capacity of LNG terminals, but uh, facts tell a different story. In less than one year, three new terminals were open and five more will be open by the end of this year for a total capacity of 50 BCM. And in 2022, we received in total 135 billion cubic metres of LNG from the global market. For, from the United States, for inst instance, we received 56.4. This is um, 34 billion cubic metres more than in previous years. The increase of gas supplies from other sources than Russia was almost 10% higher than the estimated in the March Repower EU communication. And overall, the EU phased out Russian gas by two-thirds. We packed up this diversification effort with new tools. We have introduced a common storage policy in three months, um, thanks to the work of this committee and uh, its rapporteur, um, Professor Buzak. And um, this has worked well. Uh, we filled storage up to 95% by November last year, and it's still around 57%. Um, this is more than twice the level of our underground gas storage last year. And we have introduced a framework for a coordinated gas demand reduction. All member states committed to reduce their consumption by at least 15%, and they did so. Demand dropped by more than 19% between August and January. And this helped us to save 42 billion cubic metres of gas. We have set up an energy platform to support diversification and joint purchasing, and we have introduced a mechanism to correct price peaks in the DTF gas market, not justified by the fundamentals of global markets, and we will propose to extend MCM to all other hubs. And we did all that without derailing the Green Deal. Last year, carbon emissions dropped in Europe by 2.5%. And, 
An important part of EU Power EU was to boost renewables deployment to replace gas in power generation and heating, and this has matched expectations and possibly exceeded them. Last year, we generated more electricity from wind and solar than from gas. So 2022 was a record year for solar energy in, in the EU, with 41 gigawatts of new capacity installed. And wind capacity also rose uh, by 15 gigawatts. So last year, 39% of our electricity came from renewables. And this wide-ranging change happened not just because of top-down instructions from governments. Uh, it was a grassroots movement with Europeans uh, leading the change. They have installed millions of solar PVs on the roofs. They are putting uh, heat pumps in their homes and they have adjusted their lifestyles. Um, this was sadly driven by high energy prices, but not only. Everyone has played their part. That is where we stand today, but the value of our discussion is not in looking back, it lies in looking forward to the next steps. So let me conclude by making three remarks on the future. First, on the outlook for the next heating season. We are in a good position to end this winter without any shortage and to start the next refilling season with confidence and half full storage. But uh, as Dr. Pirol will explain in a moment, we should be under no illusion that uh, things are getting easy. This year will be challenging and the year after that as well. Many uncertainties remain and we need to keep a healthy and prudent supply um, demand balance. I am going to propose to member states to prolong the voluntary demand reduction by 15% until next year. This has worked well and it's best guaranteed to achieve an adequate level of storage by November. We will continue and extend our efforts at diversification around the world and to ensure reliable supplies to Europe. Second, we received last year around 20 billion cubic metres of Russian LNG. I think that we can and should get rid of Russian LNG completely as soon as possible, still keeping in mind our security of supply. And I encourage all member states and all companies to stop buying Russian LNG and not to sign any new gas contracts with Russia once the existing contracts have expired. Committing not to renew existing contracts with Russia is the best way to give a long-term assurance to our reliable partners that meaningful demand will stay. Third, in my view, Europe will win this energy war when we finally deliver on our renewable energy objectives. For me, the end goal of Repower EU is not to replace one unreliable source of gas with another trusted source of natural gas. It is to leverage um, Europe's energy independence by massively increasing renewables. We need to accelerate our installation rate to be bolder on renewables. And to that end, we need to take five steps this year. First, the dialogue on the Red 3 must be finalised as soon as possible. I welcome the progress that we have had so far, but we need an agreement on ambitious targets and a robust enabling framework by the end of March. Second, we need to use all the potential, in particular on biomethane and heat pumps. And I will launch a practical initiative to promote biomethane um, by the end of this year. And... Um, you can also expect from, uh, from our side that um, we will uh, present a strategy on heat pumps. And um, third, we need to accelerate the construction of large-scale offshore projects. We have two summits this year, one in Ostende, another in Lithuania, and we will need to make progress. Fourth, there is a need to look at creed developments to remove a serious bottleneck and I'm advocating to include creed manufacturing in our Net Zero Industrial Act that will be presented next week. And finally, I will prioritise incentivising renewables in the reform of the electricity market design. We need a reform that will help bring down prices and protect consumers, but also that strengthen in incentives for new investments in renewables. Honourable members, one year ago, many would have said that Ending our dependency from Russia is mission impossible. And look at where we are now. This is thanks to our unity and also the work of this committee. 
Let me thank in particular you, Chairperson. Um, you have been a great interlocutor, even when we had these difficult choices uh, with Article 122 proposals. And um, we have come a long way, but we still have a tough job ahead of us. So um, I offer all my cooperation to you, but um, only together we will be able to deliver the necessary missing pieces in our legislation this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Commissioner. Thank you for uh, all your involvement. Congratulations for everything it was achieved. Thank you for coming uh, so often to ITRE committee to discuss, to take the input from uh, uh, our colleagues, uh, the good ideas that contributed also to the decisions that were uh, taken. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, thank you to whole, the whole team from DGNR and uh, everyone uh, that you coordinated uh, for the good dialogue during uh, this year of crisis. And, of course, uh, we are looking forward to work very closely together in the future. We have a, a very important privilege to have here with us today the executive director of the International Energy Agency, Dr. Fatih Birol, uh, extremely knowledgeable with a very strong voice uh, during uh, this year of uh, crisis of war, but not only, of course, uh, uh, even before, uh, uh, with the most important challenges that the international energy uh, sector, but also European energy sector faced and with a lot of very interesting solutions that I'm looking on uh, the website of International uh, Energy Agency. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Birol, you have the floor now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Busek, uh, Madam Commissioner, dear members of the Parliament. It's a great privilege for the International Energy Agency to share our views about the European energy situation of today and also tomorrow. Dear colleagues, 24th of February was a major milestone in the history of energy, not only for Europe, but for the entire world. Because Russia, the country that invaded Ukraine, is not any country when it comes to energy. As of 24th of February, Russia was the number one energy exporter of the world. Number one in oil, top oil exporter, number one in natural gas, major player in the coal markets, in electricity markets and beyond. So therefore, it triggered the first global energy crisis with implications for everybody in the world. But of course, Europe was at the epicenter of this crisis. So today, in the next few minutes, uh, dear colleagues, I would like to talk under three headlines. One is a congratulations. Second is a warning. And third is an indicating an opportunity for Europe. First, now, many people thought as of 24th of February, and there was a lot of wishful thinking from Kremlin and elsewhere that the Europe, as a result of resisting against Russia, together with uh, Ukraine and the international community, would mean, in court, Europe would freeze and Europe would have major economic damage. But European countries and the Commission moved in solidarity in a pragmatic way and took very urgent and right decisions. An International Energy Agency, only one week after the invasion, on 1st of March, came up with a 10-point plan which we have suggested to European uh, uh, governments. And today, I would like to show you why I think it is time after one year to congratulate European Union and the institutions. At the IEA, we are a number-driven organization. We make our hands dirty with data every day. 
So just with the numbers, I want to show you why it is time today, after one year, to congratulate Europe and European institutions. Number one, we have seen that the, in one year of time, Russian oil and gas revenues, a major input for the Russian budget, declined by a major 40 percent. This is, in my view, a major help to Ukrainians and Ukrainians' defense. And our analysis show that this decline will only deepen in the next months to come. The second indicator, the share of Russian gas in Europe in a very short period of time, one year is very short for the energy sector, in a very short period of time, declined substantially. Another good indicator, renewables. A huge increase in renewable energies, mainly driven by solar, but also wind and the others, huge increase about 40%. This is driven by also uh, by the fact that the many countries see renewable energies not only a solution to our climate problems, but also a solution to our energy security problems. Energy security was a key driver of the big renewables growth. Heat pumps, again a big growth. Poland is the leader, but in Finland, in the rest of Europe, we have seen huge growth in heat pumps to reduce the gas consumption. We work very closely with the manufacturers of heat pumps around the world. In Europe, they were always complaining in the past that they don't have enough work to do. Now they are still complaining because they are not able to meet the demand coming from their customers. Electric cars also a big growth. So all clean energy options increased while the gas decreased. And many people thought and said, Europe has double standards. Europe tells the world that the, we have to reduce the emissions and Europe is using a lot of coal. Therefore, European emissions will go up. Where is the European uh, instructions, European views? And these views are driven to be wrong as well. Because our numbers show that the European emissions decline is a significant 2.5%. So, dear colleagues, last year, in the middle of the first global energy crisis, Europe being at the epicenter, we have seen that the, all the efforts from Europe and its partners we were able to see Russian oil and gas revenues decline, the share of Russian energy in Europe decline, clean energy options increase, and the emissions decrease, and we have not seen a major blackout or heating problems. We did have some bruises, economic and social bruises, that's for sure, but this is far less worse than it was thought before. So therefore, my first point is congratulations to Europe and European institutions, including the Commission and Madam uh, Commissioner here. The second point, uh, dear colleagues, is a warning, as I mentioned to you. Yes, we are, as it seems, we are off the hook, if I may say so, this winter. But another winter is coming, the next winter. And there are three factors that are with us now and that may not be with us next winter. So therefore, I see in some government leaders, when I talk with them, a bit of an overconfidence about the current uh, achievements now, and therefore is my warning. My warning is next winter may be more difficult than this winter for Three reasons. Number one, this winter we were uh, lucky to import a lot of LNG from the markets to replace the Russian pipeline gas. And one of the reasons that we were able to import a lot of LNG 
is China, which is the top LNG importer of the world, Chinese economy was bad. Chinese domestic gas consumption declined for the first time in the year 2022 since 40 years. Therefore, Chinese LNG imports declined significantly. Therefore, there were a lot of LNG in the markets and we could go and buy this LNG. But now, all the indications show that the Chinese economy is rebounding. Therefore, China's LNG import needs will be increasing. Therefore, China is coming to LNG markets as a major strong buyer with strong financial muscles. This is the first reason of the warning. Second reason, every year certain amount of LNG projects finish and they come to the market available for the buyers. This year, 2023, the amount of new LNG capacity coming to uh, global markets is one of the lowest in the history. Only slightly higher than 20 BCM, which is very, very low. Therefore, the pool of LNG is rather small for Europe to, uh, uh, to buy it. This is the second reason why the warning. Third, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be realistic here that one of the factors helped us this year to go through without major problems is that we had a relatively, in fact, more than relatively, a mild winter. Nobody can guarantee that next winter will be uh, as mild as this winter. And if it is in line with the usual temperatures, then this may be a problem. Therefore, it is my warning here, we shouldn't be too relaxed, too overconfident. We should be happy with our achievement, our solidarity, our unity, our pragmatic policies, but get ready for the next winter, which International Energy Agency is again working with the uh, member countries, providing uh, guidance and suggestions to them. This is my second point. And now my third and last point. It is about the European industry. In September uh, last year, I wrote an op-ed by saying that the Europe needs to have a new industrial master plan. Because there are two major pressure points. Number one, Europe industry is based on a model which is basically getting the rather abundant and cheap Russian energy. This is finished. There is no going back. European energy in the future will be more expensive than in the past. This will put a lot of pressure on the competitiveness of the European industries, as energy is a big part of the production cost of steel, aluminium, cars, uh, whatever you, uh, chemicals, whatever you produce. If your energy input is much more expensive than your competitors, you start from a rather disadvantageous position. We read that the current European energy prices uh, uh, came down compared to the uh, 24th of February crisis. This is true, and it's a good news. But, dear colleagues, even today's energy prices in uh, Europe are three times higher than the historical averages of Europe three times higher. European natural gas prices today, which people say came down, which they did, which is right, is 
seven times more expensive than in the United States. So U.S. natural gas is seven times cheaper than a European natural gas prices. Electricity prices, which came down, yes, but they are still three times more expensive than the Chinese electricity prices. So therefore, we have a fact here, and this will not change broadly. In the future, Europe energy prices will be higher than previous European energy prices and higher, significantly higher than it is economic competitors. Therefore, European industry policy needs to change. This is the reason number one why there is a neat new European industry master plan. Number two, we are, the world is entering a new industrial age. The age of clean energy technology manufacturing. It is the batteries, it is the electric cars, solar panels, windmills, SMRs, and all of them. And who is going to produce this? Currently, there is one country is making a major, major inroads. It is China. When, I look, when you look at this chart, you see that China is currently dominating the game. For example, batteries, which is the main component of clean energy in many reasons. 75% of the batteries in the world is today manufactured in China. And the United States came up with the Inflation Reduction Act to be a part of the new industrial age clean energy technology manufacturing, and our numbers show that the even Euro IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is fully successful, goes seamless. The 75% of the share of batteries, the, the China's share of batteries in the world, will go down only to 55%. And what about Europe? And I think Europe needs to be also the part of clean energy uh, technology manufacturing. And it is the second reason I believe Europe needs to analyze in the entire supply chain of clean energy where Europe can have a competitive edge and what kind of financial, economic and also uh, energy policies need to be put in place. Otherwise, Europe industry will be first uh, producing not competitive products and, comp uh, and producing obsolete products. And it is the reason why we need to see a new European industry uh, uh, master plan in line with the new cost of energy realities and in line with the next chapter of industrial age. If not, and I am finishing here, I believe European economy will get a big hit. And as the industry sector is a major backbone of the European employment, we will see significant employment and social uh, pressures and a weak European economy. And being less competitive in the industry sector would mean the Europe's status in the international affairs will be diminished. So these are the three points I wanted to bring to your attention. The first of a congratulations of the last year's performance and heads up for the next winter and every bit the uh, longer term, the industrial competitiveness and the opportunity. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, reminding us uh, some important realities for uh, uh, telling very clearly what many of us are thinking, that uh, the bad days are not over yet, I hope, but could, we should prepare maybe for some difficult situation um, during next winter, and you, you gave the main reasons. And also, okay, of course, uh, uh, looking to the industrial competitiveness of our industry, an issue very dear to the heart of uh, many colleagues in the committee. I go now to the first round. Uh, 
Please, uh, dear colleagues, and please also, dear guests, to respect now the times, because we have a press conference at 12.15, and uh, the journalists uh, generally expect us to be on time there. But we have enough time for our dialogue. And I go with the first round, the round of coordinators or representative of the political groups. The first intervention, Mr. Christian Hiller, EPP coordinator. Thank you, Chair. Madam Commissioner, Mr. Pirol, I mean, we had been thoroughly reading what the EA had been publishing, and my first question is from both sides. Um, do you, Mr. Bureau, have the impression that the Commission takes, and the Member States, take the right measures? And the same question goes to the Commissioner. Um, is the Commission, but also what is the impression by the Commission, are the Member States taking the right measure to consider that gap? Second question, um, you have, Commissioner, you had heard what uh, Mr. Biro was saying on the competitiveness. We are discussing now a um, proposal from the Commission on um, clean hydrogen. Um, there is nothing mentioned about comparative costs. So have you any idea what are the comparative costs of producing clean hydrogen related to your proposal, given that in terms of the IRA, an investor has a precise idea what is, are these energy costs, because the Americans are addressing the CAPEX, and they have a precise idea about the costs of hydrogen. So where do you see your proposal? Because it's described by the industry and stakeholders as overcomplicated, overdescriptive, and would lead to much higher comparable costs than clean, energy, clean hydrogen produced in the US. And my last question is a little bit to... Um, the market interventions and the dreams here. I mean, um, we should be grateful that the Commission, like a crab, was going sideward when asked to intervene in the gas market prices because it was, an, um, let's say, the way the Council wanted to solve their own problems internally by handing that over to the Commission. But let's have a look. I mean, what in effect happened is... Um, that the ECI that operates the TTF market in the Netherlands has set a virtual trading point in London now in case the gas price cap is triggered. So I would like to ask you, I mean, how do you see that? I mean, the effect of all that ballyhoo was simply that we are um, shifting out the trading hubs out of Europe. So what do you expect in terms of um, a potential intervention into the electric electricity price market? Um, I think the first leak proposals, we see that as fairly positive, but I mean, in relation to what happened on that intervention attitude of the gas market, what do you expect from the electricity market and the results of an intervention from the Commission in this market? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Signora Toya, Vice President of the Committee, on behalf of SND. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you very much, Chairman. And thanks to the Commissioner and the Director of the Agency. Today's meeting has given us a lot to think about for our future and present work. So very interesting indeed. Madam Commissioner, we have been able to face this uh, emergency with a terrible shock that came out of the uh, war in Ukraine and all its consequences. We've managed to overcome that terrible moment by combining emergency uh, measures such as uh, storage and at the same time pursuing a medium and long-term strategy to change our energy mix and uh, thinking about new actions for renewables. What are we going to do so as not to rest on our laurels, which we can't afford to do? In the short term and immediate measures, well, Commissioner, I think the issue of prices, which you touched on quite rightly, is now central. How can we make sure that our stocks, our needs as stocks, uh, give rise to an excess of demand and increases that we can't afford? We actually have to reduce prices. So how do we do this? Do we buy in bulk? Do we buy together? There are diff disparities in uh, costs in uh, a lot of countries. It's higher in my country than in others. This has an impact on uh, not only Italian industry, but uh, the single European market. So what can we do beyond member states' uh, uh, goodwill? They're not uh, getting together to create what 
I think is a, a, an inevitable future, which is the, an energy union. How can we uh, get other energy into the mix? I think biomethane is important, but we need everything. We even need hydroelectrics, but I'm not going to go into that now. So the initiative that you talked about for biomethane is a market that's uh, having trouble getting off the ground. It's very fragmented. It's uh, small units. We need somebody to bring it together. We need a policy and rules, but we also need uh, industrial policies. Regarding industry, we have to help Breton and the Commission because part of that industrial policy should come out of our energy policy. I think they're a bit uh, uh, distant at the moment. We've got industry and energy on two different uh, sides of the world. We have to have uh, energy leadership in all these actions. Yeah. Au nom du groupe uh, Renew, Monsieur Grudler, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chairman. Madam Commissioner, uh, Executive Director, on behalf of the Renew Group, I would like to thank you for being here today to mark this sad first anniversary of the war and to uh, jointly analyse our energy strategy. We've published several reports, one that explained that in 2022, world energy demand increased by about 2% and CO2 emissions increased by 0.9%. At the same time, the European Union reduced its uh, CO2 emissions by 2.5%. So we're um, good students and it's important to highlight that. Firstly, two points. Firstly, we need to reduce our imports. It's not just about replacing Russian gas by becoming uh, dependent on American or uh, Chinese gas. We have to produce more at home. Reducing demand, Ms. Simpson, you're right, we have to do that, but not to the detriment of our industrial production. Often there's a link between energy consumption and a country's wealth, so we have to be very uh, vigilant of that. I think the communication of the Net Zero Act next week will allow us to move forward with clean industry. And the last point is the uh, strategic energy autonomy of the EU. We need to produce more at home, not just by dismantling uh, coal power plants, but particularly through renewable energy. And I hope that uh, these negotiations and delegated acts will uh, conclude shortly so that we can uh, start our hydrogen sector. But nuclear as well is a clean energy. And I'm glad that the uh, Energy Agency recognises the role of uh, nuclear in the decarbonisation of our world energy industry. Uh, sir, do you agree that Europe should continue to work on a regulatory framework which is adapted to uh, nuclear energy to strengthen its existing capacity uh, while working on solving problems such as waste. And Ms Simpson, within energy autonomy, when are we going to have a European nuclear alliance for tomorrow, particular on uh, small modular reactors? I know that you've been working on a partnership, but in 2023 it's finally time to launch uh, um, a European alliance on this. Thank you. In the name of the Greens, uh, uh, Mr. Dalunde, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the Commissioner and to the Director for attending this meeting and, and discussing these issues uh, with us. I have a question regarding the uh, balance between the short-term and the long-term perspective on these issues. Uh, because let's remember why we are here. Uh, we are here because there was an opportunity for Russia to use energy as a geopolitical weapon and for us to be vulnerable, vulnerable because of it, because we are relying, we are dependent on fossil fuel. And I think that the image that the director showed on the, uh, on the relative success that the European Union has had during 2022, why is this? Because we invested a lot in renewables. Otherwise, this had not been possible. And I am worried that many of the proposals on the table right now will to some extent reverse this and make it more difficult, this transition to more inherently cheap sources of energy, namely renewables. If we are using CFDs or if we are dividing the market into 
several markets uh, where um, fossil and uh, nuclear has a special price and are given uh, some extra support to be more um, uh, profitable. That can, of course, make some sense in the very short term to alleviate price, but it also undermines the profitability in investing in new renewables. Over the past few months, I've met with several stakeholders telling me that the mere existence of these proposals dampen the will of investments in new renewables. Only yesterday I, I met with a renewables company that doesn't dare to invest in renewables because they do not know how profitable they will be because they see these uh, proposals on the table that might undermine the investments in the kind of energy that will keep us independent for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dalunde. Uh, on behalf of ECR, Mr. Tobisovsky. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I will speak in Polish. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, uh, Director, Executive, uh, dear Chair. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to meet with you today, to speak with you. I think it is a crucial moment uh, to um, look back and with hindsight to sum up what we have done, what we have achieved and what we haven't been able to achieve. Uh, we have to have uh, reliable hard data on which we will base our decisions for the future. So I'm very thankful that you uh, speak about being realistic about what we have to do. The energy crisis, let me remind you, did not start when Russia attacked Ukraine. <laughs> let me remind you how we discussed this back in 2021, when we were afraid of historic winter conditions. So, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the pandemics uh, played a role because it disrupted the supply chains. And this is where the crisis started, not when the war started. Uh, I'm happy to see that you are cautiously optimistic, but I have a question to both the Commissioner and the Director, because um, together with my uh, colleagues and experts, I analysed the report of, the, um, of your agency about uh, the uh, uh, global market of energy. And on page 75, we read that uh, um, producing uh, electric energy from coal uh, increased in this year by 6%. And, uh, you know, there is a list of countries that uh, uh, restarted uh, the coal um, um, energy. And, uh, you know, these are the countries ruled by socialists, for, ago, for example. So, you know, uh, my question is about coherence. Uh, you know, uh, we are reinvesting in coal industry. And also on the page 75, uh, we are talking about emissions from electric energy uh, uh, and this is an increase by 7%. You, uh, Mr. Director, uh, you gave us aggregate data and uh, rightly so, but if we break it down into individual countries, and this is what your report mentions, the situation in which, uh, in which we are, uh, well, we have to see uh, what different countries are doing. We have to show some solidarities. You know, you are extremely demanding vis-a-vis uh, -vis my country, Poland, but we see that other countries are doing the, exactly the same and even more than Poland is doing in the coal sector. So, you know, it, it is simply not coherent. Much, Mr. Tobisowski. The last intervention in the first round, uh, Mr. Botenga, the coordinator of the left, Merci, merci, uh, Madame la Commissaire. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner and uh, Director. I think that uh, we should take a few moments in a presentation to uh, exercise some self-criticism. Lots of uh, citizens are criticizing the Commission for not having uh, put a cap on energy prices. And today we're still paying the cost of that on a number of levels. Ms. von der Leyen was honest enough to admit that the market had failed in plenary. I think it's the moment now to uh, reiterate that uh, statement and draw the conclusions from it. 
You've talked about our dependence on uh, uh, Russian fossil fuels, but let's not forget that's the consequence of years of policies where we left uh, ecological transition to private companies. They could get subsidies for green energy, but they could also get subsidies for investing in fossil fuels. So regarding autonomy and the future, you've talked about shale gas and uh, liquid natural gas and so on. However, the Energy Agency also raised uh, some of the risks. If tomorrow the US decided to stop exporting their liquid natural gas uh, entirely or in part to the U European Union and decided to sell it elsewhere, either for political or economic reasons, what would the impact be on our economy? In other words, do you consider us to be a hostage of the US? Of a foreign country with uh, whom we don't always uh, align on interests? We could do that same exercise for other countries with whom we're going to replace uh, Russian imports, such as uh, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Azerbaijan, or Kuwait, which, as you know, are not uh, regimes that we always share values with. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I will kindly invite now uh, first Commissioner Simpson and then uh, Executive Director uh, Birol to answer to these questions, but please do it in five, six minutes in order to have time for the second round and then for the answers and conclusions. Dear Kadri, please. I do my best to respect uh, the time limit, but at the same time uh, answer to all the questions. Thank you for very uh, um, good uh, discussion and comments. I will start with uh, Christian Ehler and, uh, and the issue of uh, our competitiveness and high prices. First of all, I do believe that um, the temporary uh, emergency measures uh, that we put in place helped us uh, to achieve the target that we are facing right now, that uh, prices for coal, um, oil, even oil, gas and electricity are year-on-year -year basis um, significantly lower than they were last year. And um, if, uh, if uh, that has some impact, um, then it doesn't uh, mean that we can be complacent because um, we cannot continue to pay hundreds of billions of subsidies and um, this has been possible also uh, for our some temporary measures that allowed member states to reroute the revenues to, to the consumers. But um, we need to continue gas diversification efforts and use the joint purchasing to bring down the gas prices. And, and of course, this has also uh, effect on electricity prices. And third, we need to ensure that um, our industry and also our SMEs are less exposed to volatility of uh, high prices of the short-term electricity market. But that's why I will propose in the electricity market design measures to facilitate access to long-term instruments, PPAs and CFTs, um, mainly for new investments, power generation, and this will help customers uh, benefit more directly from uh, lower cost of renewable generation. But this also has its impact to our industry, our green hydrogen uh, um, sector. And, and the last question about DTF market and liquidity. We just received uh, the report from ESMA and ACER that uh, clearly stated that there has not been impact to liquidity in our gas, uh, gas market. Only that allowed us to, to move further with um, extending this MCM to also to other hubs. Um, Ms. Toya, um, um, I do agree that filling the storage by 95% um, last November um, it was a success, but came at a cost, at a high cost. And um, this is also one of the reasons why I have organised a special meeting of the Gas Security of Supply Group already in February, with all the stakeholders to discuss best practices um, in filling storage and new ways to ensure that we achieve our target this year at a lower cost. And based on this input, uh, we are publishing soon a report on the implementation of the storage regulation with recommendations and best practices. Um, and of course, I'm happy to discuss it with you. Um, and 
and there is also in parallel ongoing work um, to replace some of the natural gas with biomethane. We created last year industrial partnership, biomethane industrial partnership, and as I, I was informing you, the work is ongoing. Um, Mr. Grudler, the technology neutrality and the role of nuclear. Um, um, well, I am committed to respect technological uh, neutrality in our proposal, starting from the revision of the electricity market design, where this principle will be reflected. And from my energy portfolio, I want to bring two issues under focus. First, the se security of fuel supply for the nuclear industry, because we still do have five member states who are dependent on uh, Russian nuclear fuel. And second, uh, promote the competitiveness of the small modular reactors and the emergence of European supply chain there. And we are making progress on the SMR partnership. And, uh, and I'm happy to keep you informed when uh, dates uh, will be uh, agreed. Um, but we can already see that many member states are taking steps to explore the deployment of SMRs. And, um, and this is uh, also work supported by my services. Then uh, our challenge is short term and long term. Yes, I uh, do agree that, um, that um, um, renewables and acceleration of renewables is not anymore only about um, our um, um, climate um, commitments. It is part of our security supply uh, policies. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, this was our growth strategy. So last year, we witnessed uh, record volumes uh, of new installed capacity, both solar and wind. And, and actually, yesterday we had a solar power uh, summit here in Brussels, where uh, my Polish colleague, uh, Minister Moskva, was also one of the keynote speakers, because Poland uh, is not only under... under um, um, strong um, uh, pressure to decarbonize, but they are doing excellently. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, visible both in the uh, uh, renewable side, but also in just transition regions. Um, and, and of course, right now, member states are in the process to upgrade their national energy and climate plans. I do hope that, uh, that uh, the common targets uh, will help us to, um, to achieve um, um, higher targets uh, than, uh, than seemed possible only a couple of years ago. And, uh, and just to um, wrap up, I do believe that our electricity market uh, um, so far, single integrated electricity market brings major economic uh, and energy security benefits across the EU. Um, but it is also clear that uh, during this energy crisis, uh, we have seen some shortcomings. And now with this electricity market reform proposal next week, um, we do our utmost to bring the benefits of low-cost renewables uh, to all the consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Birol, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Also very brief uh, answers. Uh, Industrial policy is uh, to have the right industrial policy for the next chapter of the industrial age is, in my view, not only a task for the, uh, the colleagues who are working on industry. At least there are four other areas that uh, needs to be involved in making the Europe's next industrial master plan. One is the energy group, energy policy. Second is the trade policy. I think it is time for Europe to show it is trade muscles with the international partners. Third is the foreign policy. We have to see with whom we are going to work in terms of the clean energy technologies, being alliances and being uh, much stronger. And fourth is, uh, uh, of course, it is the, uh, the fiscal uh, policies. I think we need a coordination of these uh, uh, four uh, groups working with the industry policy. Now, the last colleague in from the left group mentioned something which goes most of the time unnoticed. Renewable companies, like any company, need to make, in fact, profits 
and currently many renewable companies in Europe are not making profits. So the, uh, whatever the re uh, regulation, legislation we have should make them uh, to uh, turn down to companies which make profits, therefore they can make uh, investments and open employment opportunities. I think this is something uh, that we sometimes uh, forget. We all know that the costs of renewables are going down, but this is not necessarily equal that the renewable companies are making uh, profits. Third uh, point, a nuclear. Now, uh, there are many countries in the world when we look at, at the IEA, we look at not only Europe, the entire countries, I can tell you something very clearly. Nuclear is making a comeback around the world. Japan, a major nuclear country, changing its policy, restarting its nuclear power plants and thinking of the next wave of nuclear. Korea, exactly the same, changing its policies and coming back uh, to their uh, previous nuclear policies. Go again from Europe, Middle East, India, China, uh, United States, Inflation Reduction Act provides incentives for the lifetime extension of nuclear power plants, existing ones, and also for uh, the SMRs and uh, others, Canada. And in Europe, we all know that uh, there are different uh, views. Uh, on nuclear, but countries like uh, from Sweden to Netherlands, Netherlands to Poland, France, they all look at nuclear very differently than they were uh, looking at uh, a few years ago. So, uh, therefore, it is not an exaggeration to say that nuclear is making a comeback. Now, of course, every country makes its decision by itself, talking with their people, with their industry, and take their decisions so. But in my view, if we talk about the very fact that many colleagues mentioned this, European domestic energy production need to increase, therefore Europe's reliance on the other countries should decrease, and carbon neutral way, I believe nuclear can emerge as an uh, important uh, option. My uh, last uh, two points, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. A, it is a bit of a philosophical uh, point, but some countries have mentioned. We are at such a crossroad in terms of energy and climate challenges we have, and the, both the magnitude of the challenge and the lack of time, in my view, they mean that there is a bigger role for public institutions, governments to play vis-a-vis -vis the markets. Of course, we are market-driven. Markets are the ones, uh, market forces are the ones who make the decisions. But if we are faced such immediate and strategic challenges in front of our nose, both energy security and climate change, which could, have, which could have geopolitical and humanitarian consequences, there is a, a role, a stronger role for public institutions being in the driving seat. My last point, the past policies, I believe when the, this crisis is over, when the dust settles, it is a time, it will be a time for European countries, at least some European countries, to make a self-critic of their a major strategic choice of building an economic model based on importing energy big time from one single country. This is a huge strategic mistake and Many of us are paying it, not only with the electricity and gas bills, but much beyond that. So therefore, it is of course for, not for now, but when the time comes, we have to make this discussion. International Energy Agency will be following that the discussion takes place. That, that strategic uh, decisions being reliant on fossil fuels of one single country, one single company, 
One trade route is very risky. And we have worn these years and years, and it will be the time that we sit down and maybe discuss and uh, make a self critic and uh, uh, drive the uh, uh, lessons from that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very true. I go now to the second round of interventions. Interventions of one minute, please. And I start, of course, with uh, President Jerzy Buzek. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, dear Madam Commissioner, and Executive Director, it is always a great pleasure to have you at the ITRE Committee. A lot of information and great discussion. We survived, as you said, as the European Union this winter. And of course, our um, gas storage regulation was very helpful, of course. But now is something worrying, because uh, we are saying that might be worse next year the, the next year after, after 2020, uh, 2025, so it's going worse and worse. Why? Why we feel that it could be worse? We don't have any energy supply from Russia, and we are ready to stop it forever. So, what is going worse? Probably because we've got a very good Repower EU proposal from the European Commission. Great. But we don't have enough legal framework for that. Biomethane, 35 billion cubic meters in a few years. It would be as a legal uh, uh, obligation. Uh, 10 million tons of hydrogen and all the priority corridors for hydrogen should be legal obligation. Madam Commissioner, it is just lying on the table because in our a hydrogen uh, gas package in European Parliament, we've got everything written in our regulation. So we need your support, Thank simply you. speaking. Thank and you. And to, uh, to agree with the member state that we should have all such, of course, heat pumps should be also added to this tremendous number of improvements. Otherwise, we, we will be worse and worse and worse because we assume, assume not more, no any more going back to Russia. Thank you so much, President. But, okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, Mr. Director General, thank you very much for proposal of new uh, uh, well, point of view for our industrial strategy. It's very important. Thank you so much. Mr. Gonzalez Casares, please. Gracias, thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you Director, it's a shame that you weren't here earlier on the subject of uh, renewable hydrogen because you would have seen that some people want to use hydrogen from gas rather than promoting renewable hydrogen, which would give us autonomy and which would allow Europe to lower energy prices. Renewables are the way forward. You said so. And if we want to promote renewables, then we have to uh, promote policies that go in the direction not to uh, promoting fossil fuels or favoring uh, unreliable suppliers so th I think that's a very important message let's continue on the road to renewables which along with the diversification of gas storage is going to allow us to get through the next winter as it has this one now, Madam Commissioner, on the market elements, we need support for flexibility. Will we introduce this in the next market reform? I think that's going to be necessary as we increase renewables in our energy mix. So I think that's a good path. Mrs. Wiesner, please. Renew. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you both yesterday, and it's uh, also very nice to welcome you to ITRE today, uh, both to uh, Ms. Simpson and to Mr. Birol. Um, 
many of the European countries that, have, that are not so reliant on Russian gas have one thing in common, and that's a factor I would like to bring up to the table now, and that's the, the bioenergy. And especially the case, I think one of the best examples is Lithuania. Thanks to the production of bioenergy, they were able, they were able to phase out their dependency on Russian gas long before the war started. And you, Mr. Barol, and the IAA presented the report in March 2022, where you said that Europe could double the energy production from bioenergy and to, in order to fast phase out the Russian natural gas. Despite so, the Repower EU only mentions bioenergy once. Hydrogen is mentioned over 50 times. So I would like to hear both, Mr. Barol, how do you see that uh, the European Union is neglecting your advice on this, not bringing bioenergy into the, the puzzle of solutions in the Repower EU? And what do you think the EU could do in terms of uh, enhancing and, and utilizing the potential of the bioenergy policies? And to the Commissioner, uh, Madam Simpson, do you, how do you see the red discussions on bioenergy actually risking doing the opposite, uh, lowering in the, the potential of using bioenergy as Thank a part so of the much. solution? Thank you. And Thank you. also the court case on biogas. Uh, how we will make sure that the court case on lowering the tax on biogas will not hamper the deployment of biomethane within the Repower EU. Um, the court case was Thank only two so months much. ago. Thank you so much. Mrs. Bentele, please. Hildegard, Mrs. Bentele, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, I also want to come back to a, a suggestion of you which was not yet discussed at all. It's energy efficiency, because this is we are dealing with intensively currently. So um, you made quite some proposals also b beside heat pumps, which is a problem what we heard. But I would like to hear your opinion, you know, what has been done until now, what had, has been reached also with a view to this maybe more difficult summer because we should talk about it and put pressure and maybe have your advice on what kind of support we need from governments in this regard. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Paulus, please. Thank you very much and thank you both for your inspiring inputs and your clear words. I would like to briefly focus on two points. First, we will enter into the maybe last trilog on the Energy Efficiency Directive this afternoon. And if the EU continues to neglect this energy efficiency, despite of the new realities that Dr. Birol has just outlined, we will not be able to handle not only ne the next winter, but also the years ahead. Let's not forget that energy efficiency is the base load of the energy transition. And my question to you, Commissioner, is will you commit to staying strong on the Commission's Repower EU targets this afternoon or this night? Second, the global methane tracker of the IEA produces a number of roughly 5 million tonnes of methane being emitted in the energy sector of the European Union. But taking a look over our borders, it's at least triple that amount in the MENA region alone. So, Dr. Birol, how would you judge the effect of including imports in the EU legislation on limiting methane emissions in the energy sector? Would that alleviate our situation? And apologies, I have to leave because I have to fulfill my duty as coordinator in the special COVID committee, but I will watch the recording for your answers. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Penkova, please. Thank you, Jim. I'll be speaking in Bulgarian. Uh, Madam Commissioner, Mr. Tobirov, dear colleagues, right now there is a bit of a lull uh, in the prices of natural gas as to what we had in comparison to what we had in the beginning. But the way the prices are set up, this shock has moved to the bills. There's less production, and it will be less production. Some even stopped producing electricity. There's a big problem with the commodities, for example, foodstuffs. In many member states, the prices are skyrocketing because of the electricity prices. There is a ban on the import of vegetables, some restrictive practices or freezing of prices. In countries uh, where people spend most of their money on foodstuffs, this leads to huge inflation and a lot of pressure on households. That is why the reform of this market should focus on how the prices are set up. So what are the specific measures you would take in order to reduce the energy uh, prices and the inflation in Europe? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sean Kelly, please, EPP. <coughs> 
Thank you, and thanks to Commissioner and the Director for very interesting messages and presentations. So some questions. One, if China is growing again, is there a likelihood that rather than competing against ourselves and others on the world market, that they will look to Russia to give them the growing need they have for energy? I will be hosting later on today an event on electricity market design reform on behalf of Euroelectric. And that, of course, will have to direct investment into renewables as well as storage technologies and demand-side flexibility. But also I'm interested to ask the Commissioner, where does she see the United Kingdom fitting into our situation now that we've agreed, hopefully, on the Windsor framework and back in good terms again, especially in relation to cross-border electricity trading and the single electricity market in Ireland? And the final question, how will the new legislation aid multi-purpose interconnectors, which are so badly needed? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Peterson, please. Vice Chair of our committee, Renew. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Commissioner. And, and, and thank you, uh, Director. Uh, I think, uh, Katla, you point out to uh, some of the big and, and great successes so far. I was especially happy to hear you. Uh, your ambition of prolonging the 15% obligation or, or savings obligation, at least. I think that is exactly the right tool, one of the many right tools to apply in this situation in order to ensure that we get uh, through next winter as well. So thanks for, for this. Now, now Dr. Biola, I can assure you you have many uh, readers in this room of, of, of your great publications and, and congratulations. Uh, we, we, we really uh, applaud it. Now, I also wanted to touch upon the energy efficiency issue because uh, you didn't uh, point to this in, in, in your great slides. Uh, two questions, basically. Uh, are, are we doing enough on, on energy efficiency? I mean, I, I know the easy answer is, is no, obviously not, but, but could you elaborate a little on this and what, what kind of suggestions uh, IEA might have to us on, on this? Secondly, on the renewables, to consider this in the big picture uh, related to energy security is, is absolutely right. And, 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 and on this point as well, uh, are we doing things fast enough. I know the easy answer again here is, is no. You were pointing out to 41% additions of solar and wind in your slide, but clearly if we are to meet our targets, we have to ramp up much faster than what we are capable of doing. So please, uh, a couple of words on this as well. Thank you so much and congrats with all your great work. We, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mr. Geier, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. I was listening attentively when you were talking about the burdens on European industry. Dr. Birola talked about the fact that we exposed to future energy prices. Now, I'm somewhat disappointed that everything we've read in the Commission proposals for a new m m common organisation market on electricity accommodating European industry on measures uh, such as reducing electricity prices is missing. So, Ms. Simpson, I'd be appreciative as, uh, if you can tell me why this is. There are examples from the German Institute for Economy, for example, that uh, replacement measures could be thought up uh, for a pool of contracts for difference where European business could be kitted out to be able to deal with competitive electricity prices. I'd just like to put that out in the room. If you've got something spontaneous on that, I'd appreciate it, Dr. Birol, as well. So much. Uh, Mrs. Weiss, please. Thank you uh, so much, and thank you for being with us uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Birol. It's very appreciated how uh, precise you are in uh, your recommendations. Now, I have a question regarding digitalization. In October 2022, the Commission adopted an energy action plan that aims to support development of sustainable, cybersecure and competitive market for digital energy services. Now, I will not ask you if you think that was a timely um, act. Uh, it entails a creation of a common uh, European energy data space by 2024, uh, it's about coordination at EU level, and also it points out that investments in digitalization is 
very key. Now, considering the need and the importance of digitalization in the energy sector to ensure that uh, there are more renewables in the grid uh, and to improve uh, grid flexibility and reliability, despite the intermittent re nature of renewables, what should be the most important aspects or policy measures that we as policymakers should focus on? What are the one, two most important points for us to act upon regarding digitalization and energy when we leave this very, very important meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Kaff. Kieran Kaff. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Simpson and Mr. Burrell. I want to talk about the money, uh, and I particularly want to talk about energy efficiency. Uh, Deputy Hildegard, uh, uh, Deputy uh, Peterson uh, both talked about energy efficiency, which always seems to be the bridesmaid, but never the bride. Uh, it seems to be overlooked. Uh, what can we do about this? Uh, as the rapporteur on the Recast Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, uh, I'm delighted to see the strong interest in buildings, uh, which consume 40% of energy. Uh, if we tackle buildings, uh, we're well on our way to reducing energy use and indeed uh, uh, tackling our climate goals. Um, but how can we step up the finance? At a European level, we're talking about a hydrogen bank, uh, which is great, and yes, we need that. But we also need the money for renovations. And thankfully, the European Investment Bank is strongly rebranding as the Climate Bank. The European Central Bank has came out in strong support for an energy performance of buildings directive. But can we do more about releasing uh, the money for renovations and in doing so ensure that energy efficiency makes centre stage? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Berenson, please. EPP. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, the rapporteur uh, of the European Parliament on the industry strategy, I completely uh, share uh, the call of, of Mr. Birol uh, on what is needed for industry and for our competitiveness. Competitiveness, uh, competitiveness has been uh, an issue raised by the EPP uh, continuously over the last years. Uh, and indeed, the energy price is, is one of the main aspects um, for our industry to be competitive in the coming years as well. And therefore, I, I really hope that, that next week and in the coming weeks when the uh, proposals of the Commission are presented, that we somehow see something of also a, a 10E on steroids, because I think we need cross-border projects, cross-border infrastructure to tackle the energy, energy transition and the energy prices together in, uh, in Europe. Um, I have a very concrete question to Mr. Birol. In uh, your report of the EIEA e e e e e e e e um, of December, you mentioned that the EU's potential gas supply demand gap could reach 27 billion cubic metres in 2023. And I'm wondering where we are now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Heiser, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear Commissioner, uh, I, I would like to ask you, you know, uh, we really managed to secure enough of energy sources for this winter. But... Uh, because uh, we were helped also by the weather, as it was said, also by the absence of the China on the uh, LNG market. And it's also positive that Europe uh, will end with uh, relatively large stocks this winter. It's okay, yeah, but do you expect uh, that the uh, storage uh, will be filled to the level about the 90% also by this November? Uh, without major problems. I mean, taking account that also uh, for the last uh, year we feel the storage also by the Russian gas. My second uh, question is um, uh, one of uh, the possibilities, which is really not popular because we are dealing with a Green Deal, is uh, to increase our resilience uh, of the EU in case of the oil and gas supplies. Uh, it rely on our own reserves. It means uh, exploration and uh, ex eventual extraction yeah, of, uh, of the deposits that we have in Europe. What is your view on this? For example, in account the Netherlands and uh, what is happen happening in the Netherlands. And uh, do you see uh, it also as an opportunity to strengthen energy security? Because Thanks. despite the obvious trends uh, of the decarbonisation, we will need these fuels for, I don't know, maybe 10 years at least. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Heisel. Uh, Mrs. Cornelia Erst. 
Herr Greens. Ja, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Thank you to Ms. Simpson and Mr. Birol. I'd like to touch on a different aspect that hasn't been mentioned yet. We're saying, yes, we want to leave Russian energy imports behind. We want to be independent of those. Fair enough. Nevertheless, we need natural gas. We've spoken about Norway to date, but there are also countries in the global south. In uh, Africa, for example, where there's a run, in Senegal as well, where there are massive investments in completely new fossil fuel infrastructure going on. And, of course, in this conjunction, we need to look at the lock-in effect being avoided with these investments in new fossil fuel infrastructure. So my question is quite simple. When you're talking to countries in the global south, how do you view that? Um, who are the most important providers of natural gas? How do you estimate the political role in future as well of, say, Senegal, these sort of countries, probably others as well? And what's your level of knowledge of negative impacts, negative environmental impacts that can come of this? Begin, please. Thank you, Chair. I switch to Italian. Um, grazie. Thank you very much, Commissioner and uh, Dr. Birol, for this very interesting presentation. I think all the subjects were touched on, but uh, as other colleagues, I would underline the issue of funding the transition and all the energy projects associated with it. I think the uh, quick adoption of Repower EU and all the actions this year has shown us that we can respond to an energy shock if we do it together, just as the way, just as we did to the shock of the pandemic. However, we're going to really need uh, transitional funding where other players, such as the US, are still quite strong. The IRA is a, a, a slap that really resonated. Discussions on state aid is not enough. We have to make sure that our uh, single market is not at risk. We're looking forward to receiving the proposal on the reform of the electricity market, but we see that today now we have strategic uh, companies closing because the threefold uh, energy costs are not sustainable. Mrs. Piraki, please. It's your turn. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner and Dr. Birol, for being here with us. And it is important to have the details from the host mouth. But uh, I would like to stick on the on the early warning coming from Mr. Birol, particularly not only on the on the issue that the next window will be much more difficult than the current one, but also on the issue that it is uh, uh, we are we have to look for for solutions that they are combining the the addressing of the challenges of climate change and also the energy security issues. In this regard, I would like to focus on the issue of the, of the green hydrogen and the recent developments we have here in the EU concerning the legislation. Uh, Madam Commissioner, my question is this. A lot of concerns are coming from, from the industry uh, uh, regarding the, the two delegated tax that are, they are drafted and are in place uh, this period. And I would like to ask you if you are going to proceed with clarifications in order to, to address address the concerns coming from the industry. At the same time, it is also important to ask Mr. Birol if he has some kind of uh, specific suggestions in order to have a fast-track development deployment of, hydrogen, of green hydrogen deployments uh, in order to, to increase the security of supply. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, Mr. Fuchs Lang, our Rapporteur for Energy Efficiency. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Simpson and Mr. Birol for your analysis. Um, I am the rapporteur of the Energy Efficiency Directive, which we'll be, we will be negotiating later today with uh, the Commissioner and the Council. And we are struggling here in the European Parliament to keep a high level of ambition. 
uh, we know that from the analysis of the Commission that one third of the ga natural gas savings from the Fit for 55 package will have to come from the NFD efficiency directive. Uh, and that is why we uh, want a high target and we think that the Repower EU proposal from the Commission is a good one. So I'd like to ask uh, Fati, Mr. Fatih Birol on how you see uh, the role for energy efficiency in the analysis that you presented to begin with, if we are to meet these challenges of which you speak, how, um, how important will energy efficiency be and what will your advice to, to us be in relation to uh, this area, energy efficiency? Thank you. Thank you so much. Last intervention, Mr. Bloss, please. I think he needed to leave. Then uh, many, many questions. <laughs> Also suggestions. Uh, uh, I kindly invite you now to answer to, to this, and then, of course, uh, Mr. Birol. Uh, please, Commissioner Simpson. Thank you, and um, I very much um, enjoyed our open exchange views today. Um, as you know, um, Parliament has invited me to be in front of plenary next Tuesday um, on a on, uh, topic how we can ensure security in the EU, energy security in the EU this year. So I will um, try to be very brief so that uh, Dr. Birol will have more time because we will enjoy an hour uh, on Tuesday. But I will start with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Buzek's question why we are worried about this winter. This is very simple. Russia still delivered 60 billion cubic metres of gas via pipeline last year to Europe. Um, the rest that they didn't deliver anymore, they were not able to sell to alternative markets because they don't have alternative pipeline network. That means that was lost to global markets. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is 60 more to lose. Um, we were able to replace partially this with LNG, but uh, LNG markets this year will be significantly more competitive because um, due to the demand from uh, Asia. So uh, we know that uh, we have to replace the remaining gas uh, with renewables and we have to prioritize savings. So I, um, I assure you, energy efficiency is a top priority of ours uh, without savings, without prolonging also uh, our temporary measures to cut gas consumption, but also um, to prioritize these efforts that member states made to cut electricity peak hour consumption we will be in difficult, uh, more difficult situation. And that, of course, means that, uh, that you can expect that um, we will address all the remaining bottlenecks, so not any more permitting that we have addressed. Uh, but we have lack of skilled workforce, supply chain for some uh, renewable um, sectors are too, well, too long, and, and, of course, creeds. Well, uh, you can shorten the permitting, but if uh, our creeds are not able to connect all those installations, we are missing the target. And, uh, and as I uh, mentioned, these, some of these um, uh, we will address uh, next week in our Net Zero Industrial Act. And, um, and from my side, in the longer perspective this year, uh, I want to propose uh, also industrial partnership to work on skills and uh, to push uh, the new eco-design and energy labelling of cooling and heating appliances so that we can replace in building sector uh, fossil fuels with heat pumps. And, uh, and then, of course, we are very dependent on our trusted partners. There was a question about our cooperation with the UK. We have praised a lot uh, our partners from Norway and Azerbaijan and Algeria and the uh, United States. But, of course, UK is also a like-minded partner who accelerates uh, offshore wind and has delivered some very necessary gas uh, in previous year. And I hope that our cooperation is now on a steady um, base. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Not tomorrow. <laughs> this evening and next week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Please, Mr. Birol, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, Mr. Chairman, first of all, I think it is the last round uh, we are talking. I, uh, it's the first time I came to this committee in person. I can tell you I am very impressed with the questions and the, very surprised with the fact that many of you 
read our reports. I am really honored for that, and I will tell my colleagues when I go back to Paris. And in response, uh, Mr. Chairman, may I offer the members of this parliament, when they were to come to Paris, I have a wonderful office with the Eiffel Tower view and very nice coffee machine to invite you to come to my office and have a discussion on these issues more in depth. And thank you very much for your interest uh, once again. Invitation Ms. accepted, and thank you for this. Thank you very much. But uh, please, one by one, so not all of you at the same time, so I have a small office. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. So, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Buzek said, why don't we stop completely uh, next year? We have to think of 2017, 2019, 2030, that the uh, reliance on the Russian gas or other countries' gas. Now, the energy sector is a very particular sector. It is not like the IT sector. If you don't like your iPhone, you can change it immediately. But energy sector is bound with a huge infrastructure and the uh, consuming uh, equipments. It is like a, not like a bicycle, like it's like a big tanker, and you change the, uh, the route very, very slowly, unfortunately. Therefore, as I try to say, we made a huge mistake in Europe by having an over-reliance on one country's fossil fuel exports. It is in my view, we said several times to those countries, to put the old eggs in one basket was a strategic mistake. And in my view, I am an energy person, not only an energy mistake, but it's a foreign policy mistake and a geopolitical uh, mistake. So therefore, it will take some time. We are going in the right direction. We can definitely accelerate this and uh, we can uh, definitely learn from this lesson. And the now steps we take should be uh, uh, based on these lessons. One of them is the questions one of the colleagues ask, uh, from which countries we can get uh, new gas uh, imports? Now, there's a lot of discussion at the IEA. We know all the countries, how much each country has gas reserves, how much they can export, and what does it cost? But, I think as Europe, we have to be very careful because we have an energy security problem now, but we have another challenge, which is the climate change. We shouldn't forget and we should be proud that the Europe was the champion years and years of fighting against climate change. We shouldn't leave it to the other countries. So therefore, uh, when I look at the numbers, before the invasion, European gas consumption was in a decline already. It was declining. Now, the, the gas we are going to find should be the one that will replace the Russian gas we would need. And in that respect, since the European economy should not be relying disproportionately on gas, the gas contracts we are going to make, country X, Y, or Z, I hope it will be diverse, should be as much as possible short-term contracts, and the projects we are making to import that gas, transport that gas, should be designed in a way that that can be re repurposed to use hydrogen in the future. So these are the two things that I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Right countries, flexible and not long-term contracts as much as possible, and also uh, design the infrastructure accordingly that they can be uh, repurposed. Mr. Chairman, one other issue I am so happy to hear uh, that many colleagues mentioned energy efficiency. In Europe, I mean, every country has an energy uh, potential. Some countries have oil, some have gas, some have huge in the world, some have coal, some have uh, hydropower. But all the countries have one energy source potential, which is energy efficiency. And in Europe, we got it. We did a good job up to now, but there is a huge potential to improve it, which means that, as one of the colleagues put very eloquently, it is the base load of our energy system. How do we do it? There are two ways. One, providing incentive for the consumers to do it. In terms of uh, consumers, what kind of incentives? More financial incentives. In terms of buildings, for example, one of the colleagues mentioned, uh, the buildings. Today, in Europe, we, are, we have a very old building stock and we are renovating only 1% of our buildings each year. 
to be in line with our climate targets in Europe, Fit for 55, it should be three times higher, the renovation in the buildings. So one area is providing incentive for uh, uh, efficiency, and the other one is, in line with what I said in the previous round, the public sector being in the driving seat a bit more in, than in the past, regulations, standards and norms, they should be stricter and stricter uh, in my uh, view. And uh, there are long-term uh, uh, standards, norms of regulations, and as Madam uh, uh, Commissioner said, uh, the, uh, for the next uh, year, uh, having the 15% clausule is a, a good one. Methane. So when we talk about climate change, we talk all the time on uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But there is another one which is a bit more uh, under the shadow of uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, but it is even more dangerous because in the short term, it is creating a lot of problems for us. And, but the good news is reducing methane emissions is much easier and much less costly. 75% of the global methane emissions in the world today can be minimized and nullified at no cost. At no cost if you take the right measures. Because it is basically fixing the pipes that they don't, methane doesn't leak, gas doesn't leak. I just make it too extreme, but just to make it that you don't need a big technology, you don't need to discover anything, you just need the, the, the oil and gas industry not to be greedy, but to make the investments in order to uh, make the necessary, uh, take the necessary steps. So therefore, uh, it is the EU's position in terms of uh, uh, the uh, gas imports, putting the methane emission as an important uh, item is in my view very good. And in my view, there may be even a room for making them even uh, sicker. So methane, please let's keep an eye on uh, that. The, Again, the uh, question, uh, are, what can we do more in uh, renewables? We can do many things, but if, I can, if, I, if you give me the right to ask for one thing only. You know why we had a big increase last uh, uh, year? Because of the following. Many countries were in a problem. How can we bring energy? So therefore, they did something that they didn't do long times. They have cut the permitting and licensing time. So this is the, it creates a lot of, lot of problem that the, a lot of projects are in the bureaucratic phases of getting the, uh, the uh, licensing from, uh, and the permitting from the authorities. Governments need to do one small thing. Increase the workforce in the permitting licensing bureaus, offices and make it much more nimble. So this is the, if you ask me one thing, I am a, a, a pragmatic man. This is the, when I look at, we talk with the companies, um, of course, every company, when I talk to business, they always are tax incentives, this and that. But the main issue is today, the fault line is permitting and licensing takes a lot of time in Europe. Please, 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 shorten it as much as uh, possible. If it is uh, one thing, I would like to uh, mention that. Two last points, Mr. Chairman. I know that you want me to uh, finish, but... The journalists, I, yes. Two, two last points. In my view, bioenergy is the blind spot of the, uh, the European uh, uh, energy debate, in general, with the NGOs, with everything uh, together. We have a lot of potential there in terms of bioenergy. If we play our cards uh, well, we can make a significant amount of uh, contribution. I have to just say it and uh, stop it here. Especially in some countries, it can make a substantial contribution if we uh, play our cards uh, uh, right. The last two points, I'm sorry, one in the uh, uh, grids uh, and digitalization, the other one is uh, on uh, hydrogen. Now, dear colleagues, just let me tell you one thing, very helicopter view. We have oil, gas, renewables, this and that, hydrogen. But the, when I look at the global energy picture, where it came, and talking with the investors, companies, where it will go, uh, governments, I can tell you something very simple. The future is electric. The global energy system will be more and more electric. It is under transportation, 
how we our mobility system, how we at home, how we use energy for heating, for uh, for everything. Our industry sector, the tra the transit and the electricity side, electricity will be very important for in our lives. Less fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, less uh, uh, molecules, and more electricity. Now here, what is important? We all want to see new power plants, solar and wind, some of us nuclear, some of us this. But the veins, if you think of the body, human body, the veins the, is the grids. How strong, how well designed, how modern and how flexible our grids are. And what makes our grids more smart, much efficient, and uh, much uh, better in terms of the electricity movement is the digitalization. So the right digital policy married with the right clean energy policy is the, uh, the formula for the success for Europe and elsewhere. For hydrogen, uh, in fact, when you look at uh, Europe, there is one lesson we have to learn, and I, I have to uh, mention this, Mr. Chairman. We all talk about solar energy, and I show you a chart that today China produces about 90% of the solar panels in the world. But 20 years ago, the picture was very different. It was Germany, it was Spain, it was Italy that uh, started the, uh, the uh, solar, put a lot of subsidies, but after a few years, they dropped the ball and China continued. And today China is leader. A clean energy technology is like running a marathon. Okay, it's 42 kilometers. Europe ran the marathon first 10 kilometers in the front. But then slow down, get tired, uh, thought of something else, and China came and uh, left, uh, passed Europe and became number one. Nobody... Nobody gives a gold medal in the marathon who finishes the 10 kilometers as the first. If you want to get the gold medal, you have to finish the 42 kilometers first, which means the policies, the right policies put in place and giving a confidence to the investors. And it is the reason I am saying that for the hydrogen, for the electrolyzers, we have to give a visibility to the investors, financial visibility. This is the uh, only thing I would like to say in terms of hydrogen, but we should be aware that today, in terms of cost competitiveness, Europe is not the very best place. We have to improve that. And second, maybe last warning, please, please, hydrogen, not today and even not tomorrow, will be solved of our problems, maybe the day after tomorrow. So please do not expect that the hydrogen will, uh, uh, will solve all of our problems from one day to other. It will grow. It will, uh, with the uh, increasing demand, giving them incentives. But to have a fixation that the hydrogen will solve our problems in the short or even in the medium term uh, would be taking our attention from the uh, solutions that we have under our hands uh, now and lose some uh, perhaps uh, time and uh, uh, attention. Just wanted a friendly uh, warning here, Mr. Chairman. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really a very interesting meeting, a privilege to have Commissioner Kadri Simpson, uh, Executive Director Birol, uh, together with us today. With this, uh, I formally close the meeting. Uh, see you next time. Thank you very much, colleagues. We run to the press conference. Thank you.